Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual roundtable discussion hosted by Altius Healthcare Consulting Group. Today, we're pleased to welcome panelists Susan Heck from Corazon and Johnny Tiller, one of our clinical consultants, and will be moderated today by Altius CEO Stephanie Dorward. Thank you very much, and welcome everyone to this edition of the Altius Roundtable conversation today regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and responses. Uh, today, I'm really excited to share some of the information that we're going to bring to you and be joined by Susan Heck from Corazon, as well as Johnny Tiller, one of our clinical consultants. Information we're going to cover today ranges everywhere from communication techniques that you can use currently with your hospitals to the response that's happening with our frontline nurses and doing some recognition for Nurses Week. Uh, we're all honored and you know humbled by the work that our nursing staff and the nurses do across the country. So look forward to having a conversation regarding that information. And also we're gonna wrap up today with information from Susan Heck on, from Corazon and really be focusing in on you know, what is happening across the country with specialty practices. Uh, we all know that elective surgeries have been halted in many hospitals and healthcare organizations now for seven weeks, eight weeks, for months on end. Every state is reopening at a different pace. And in many cases, a lot of us are wondering, you know, what the timeline is in our state? How should we best approach this? So we brought this topic together and we have Susan with us today to share information with you on what should you be thinking about as you work to reopen your cardiology practice reopen your neurology practice, reopen your orthopedic practice, or specialty services in general. So I'm so excited to really share the stage with these two women today and share more information with all of our listeners. So let's get started. So first of all, this is Nurses Week, and there has never been a more important time in the history of healthcare to really recognize and honor the work that our nurses, doctors, and everyone else is doing on the front lines. So hats off to everyone that has been dedicating countless hours, giving long shifts, whether you're focusing on the planning of the response, the planning of the reopening, or just the day-to-day -day shifts that you're working actually in the front lines, our hats go off to you. Altius Healthcare Consulting Group honors you and is extremely thankful for all of the work that you're doing to keep our communities safe, to keep our hospitals safe, to treat the patients, and ultimately to give back to the communities that all of you serve. You know, we all really enter into healthcare because we're primarily mission driven. I know that for myself, I really started my healthcare career because I always wanted to be a doctor growing up. You know, from the time I was a little girl until, you know, even now, I always honored and recognized the work that doctors did. And I initially wanted to be a pediatrician. Uh, my mathematics background kind of took precedence over that. And I ultimately ended up with a mathematics degree. But I'm so honored to be able to give back to the healthcare world through analytical fashion and providing performance improvement services. So with that, hats off to everyone. And today, in honor of Nurses Week, we brought back Johnny Tiller to share some information with all of you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what she's been hearing in response to the current situation and allow her to recognize and talk through some of the things she's been hearing. So Johnny, welcome back to share more information with our listeners. Thank you, Stephanie, I appreciate that. Well, nursing is a profession that I absolutely love. I am a nurse and I'm very, very proud of that. And I've been a nurse for over 40 years, which is a little scary that the time happened like that. But nursing actually started, um, the recognition of nursing started back in 1820. And in 1820, that is when there was the birth of Florence Nightingale. And that's what we celebrate as the profession of nurses is the birth of, um, of uh, Florence Nightingale. And she was actually born in May 12th, in, uh, two, in 1820. And May 12th is the actual day of celebration for nurses. We tend to celebrate the entire week because nurses are very important to the success of healthcare and caring for our patients in the hospital and in the community. Um, she was sort of ahead of her time. She was a statistician. Uh, she relied on data, and if you think about that back in 1820, for somebody to think um, based on data is quite interesting because we think of that only in our time frame. So she started the, the perspective, and she was also um, quite, quite strong when it came to infection control practices and led the way for the profession of nursing and how we're going to care for patients in the future. Um, so nurses tend to celebrate the entire week. 
And one of the things about that celebration is that it's important to understand that nurses want to feel that they are recognized, that they are understood, that they're respected. Um, and that sounds very simple, but it's something that with the healthcare executive team, it's not something that you do on the day of once a year. It's something that you do throughout the year, and that is developing that relationship, that relationship of trust and respect with your nurses. And so on the day of or the week of the celebration, they already have a relationship of trust. And so the, the important part of that is that we have communication with your nurses. They are very intelligent uh, professionals that um, need to be communicated with and also want to understand what's going on with the organization. And that includes the understanding of what's going on in finance in the organization and what's going on in the community and on, at a national level. So that ongoing communication is critical with our nurses is that they need to be part of the solution not part of, I hate to say it that way, but part of the problem. And what I see with communication and what I hear from my fellow colleagues is that sometimes there's um, a little frustration. They feel like they're uh, celebrated that week, but they never see the executives throughout the entire year. So that presence and visibility is very important. And I will tell you, I've been a CNO and I've been a senior VP and I've been a CEO and an administrator of a hospital. And I understand how difficult that can be for the executive level because many times we go, oh my God, I have got way too much on my plate. It is on the plate, but it's not, it's not the top 10. What I'm here to tell you is the nursing profession, respecting and understanding and communicating, visibility, accessibility, that has to be in the top 10 of your um, to-do list uh, on a daily basis. That relationship is critical. Because one of the things I tell people is that if the nurses don't show up, you don't have a hospital. It's that simple. You close the unit. You don't admit patients. You can't function. They are a critical component of hospital operations, and they are due that respect. And so um, the recognition, the respect is important. Developing the relationship of trust is important. Uh, communication. Communication is not just what you think they need to know. When you go to the units and, and you talk with, with the nurses, it's important that you actually ask them, how are things going? What do I need to know? What can I do for you? And listen, the, remember we're all taught the, the critical factor of how important it is to listen. I'm here to tell you today that you have to fine tune those skills because listening and observing what's going on in the hospital is critical to the success of that hospital. And so that communication, presence, visibility, relationship of trust is very important. They're not gonna trust you if you only show up on uh, Nurses Week. They have to have that ongoing uh, trust with you throughout the 365 days. And then uh, communication, and I know a lot of people ask, what's the best form of communication? Well, like I said at the very beginning, I've been doing this for over 40 years, and there is no answer to that question. You can never successfully say, I have communicated with staff. It's an ongoing evolution of what works with the different um, environments that you're dealing with. Some nurses like uh, uh, things that are written through um, the, um, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here, but they, they prefer to be communicated only through email or through written communication. Some nurses prefer communication face-to-face. -face. And I know a lot of folks are doing daily huddles and that's a critical component that we have found very successful throughout our organizations. Daily huddles also address what is critical that day, what's the most important operationally. But it's also a great time if, if you're doing it throughout the year um, to do snippets of communication at that moment when you're present. I've been in places where daily huddles are actually um, include the CEO of the organization and the CFO of the organization. I was actually quite impressed because if it was a priority for them, it, it was very evident by their presence and their visibility. And so the nurses had a very strong connection and relationship to the executive team 
So it's quite impressive when you see the daily huddles utilized in that manner. So um, I would think I would finish by my importance here today. I would finish by this is a time to say thank you. Um, it's a very simple two words that mean a whole lot to the nurses. They want to see the, the executive team. They want to see the directors, the um, administrative directors, and they also want to see their managers. A lot of times we leave it up to the managers, and this is a time where you can't. You have to be visible and present. Um, so um, my hats are off to the nurses. I absolutely love the nursing profession. It's been very good to be, and I'm very, very proud of the nurses that we have. It's been a very difficult time with COVID-19, varying levels. Some organizations are right in the trenches. Um, when you think of the tertiary hospitals or the metropolitan areas, those nurses, it's it's a tough time. And, and, and most recently, I don't know if you guys saw with the president and the, and the nurses were asked the question of, do you have the supplies that you need? And the nurses responded with, it's sort of sporadic. And um, that's important to understand that they are telling you at the front line what it's like. Sometimes they have the supplies they need, sometimes they don't. Sometimes the resources are actually having enough staff. I've read and seen um, several incidents where nurses have reported to duty in the next shift, actually reported that I'm not coming on duty with the patient load that's being given to me. And the patient load is very appropriate, one to 30. Oh my God, I can't even imagine. But the nurses that are committed to the community, the patients and their profession stay and I, my hats are off to you. You guys are the best. I know that it was very difficult, but I also recognize that, that you were committed to doing the right thing and uh, we can't have enough of you. I always also highlight the part about the 80-20 rule, the Pareto analysis, 20% is the one that is getting 80% of the attention. Unfortunately, we do have uh, nurses within our profession that um, they're angry, they're frustrated, and um, some are very uh, good at communicating how they feel. And it's not to diminish what they're saying, but we really need to turn the tables back to 80% of the population. And they are um, very proud of their profession. And so sometimes the noise that you hear is that 20% that's angry um, and they probably have been angry for years and they're just having an opportunity to have a voice. That's unfortunate because if you have good communication with administration, that voice is heard throughout 365 days a year. So uh, hats off to the nursing profession. I'm very proud of you and I'm proud to be uh, a member of the profession of nursing and um, uh, happy Nurses Week to all of you and I uh, wish you only the best. Thank you, Johnny. I think you touched upon some great information there. And you know, your your advice on the communication piece is more important now than it ever has been in the past. And I really liked your idea of having more people involved in the daily huddles and communicating the daily huddle information. I've also pulled together some additional um, points on communication because this has been one of the topics that we've really been hearing. Uh, more recently and communication is on everyone's thoughts and their minds right now and as Johnny mentioned if you stream through your social media whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter you're going to see mostly the negative information and the problems and from that perspective what we're hearing from our clients and what we're communicating to our clients is it's important for all of us within the hospital industry the healthcare industry to share the positive because if you're sitting at home watching CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, Fox News, whatever your channel of choice is, or streaming through social media, we have to understand that our communities, our patients, they are seeing that same information and it strikes fear in them. It strikes fear about, is my family going to be harmed? Is it wrong for me to go to the doctor? Am I gonna get COVID-19 if I go to the doctor? Should I still have my surgery? I have a heart issue, do I go to get monitored? All of these things are gonna be near and dear their hearts and their concern. So as healthcare leaders, it's our priority and it's important to us to make sure that we are communicating, communicating with our staff, communicating with our patients, communicating with our communities and our stakeholders. And the great thing is that there has been no other time in history where we have more communication options. Just like we see on social media with all of the other entities and organizations that are using social media as a venue, we can use this as a platform for us to share our information. 
we can also utilize this as a way to reach more members of our community. I'm sure many of you have had town hall meetings in the past, whether it's for your staff or for your actual patients. And those town hall meetings, sometimes we take months to plan for them. We put together PowerPoint slides. We're so excited. We advertise in multiple venues where it's on the newspaper, it's every place. And then we're there in front of the audience of 10 people. And I think, you know, it's always been, you know, heartbreaking to some of us that we want to share new services that we have. We want to communicate this, but then no one's there to actually listen. Guess what? You now can have your town hall meetings. And we've had some hospitals that had phenomenal attendance in platforms like this, utilizing platforms like Zoom, like GoToMeeting, like interactions where you can actually invite all of your community to participate and have your CEO, your CFO, your chief nursing officer, your director of quality, share what you're doing, share your reopening process, share which services are reopening and what the timeline is. And by putting all this information out there where people are currently consuming it, you're going to regain the community that you may have lost during the short term. So accessing everything, whether it's communicating with your stakeholders through Zoom, whether it's holding a town hall and weekly update, whatever it is, there's never been a better time at all to utilize this. And we're having some foundations that are now doing this with virtual events, really taking their purse auctions online to be able to raise money. And again, there's never been a better time than before to sell tickets to something like that or bids on something than it is right now because most people are at home consuming content and participating in these types of activities. So take control of the communication at your facility. Please do not allow the media outlets to be the only way you communicate with your stakeholders and communicate with your patients. You need to take control of the messaging and make sure that you, if you want them to trust you, you have to provide them information that they can trust. And we're in the best situation to do that is the individual leaders, the individual managers, and the individual owners of the hospitals, the healthcare entities. So take the message out there, you know, make sure that you're accessing it. And now there's never been a better time than now to get in front of your audience. And with that, we're gonna welcome Susan Heck to the table. She's going to talk to us about specialty services and what all, all of us should really be thinking about, you know, as far as what is the COVID-19 pandemic impact on current practices and future practices. And we're really pleased to have Susan with us today. She has a wide varying background. So we can see from her information on the next slide that we have a summary of her 30 plus years of healthcare experience. And I could certainly introduce her, but she probably can do a much better introduction on some of her background herself. So Susan, welcome to the round table. And if you can just start by sharing a little bit of information on who you are and what Corazon does, I think it would be a great place for us to start. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Well, I did add a picture to the slide because I wanted to be sure you could see what I looked like pre-COVID. Haven't seen my hairdresser in um, multiple weeks. So uh, I, I like you, we're probably all due to uh, be, be back and out of our um, isolation at homes, et cetera. I do want to echo um, you know, what's been said about the, the nursing staff and um, what a remarkable job they're doing on the front lines. And it's, it's really humbling to see some of the efforts and some of the sacrifices they're making for patients. Uh, in addition to their colleagues in EMS, et cetera, and physicians, but they have really done a remarkable job. Um, I actually have 30 plus years experience in healthcare. I was in the acute care world in a, in a role as uh, vice president of institute services at a large tertiary teaching hospital. I moved into the consulting world about 20 years ago and really have worked with um, my company, Corazon Inc. Uh, in developing specialty service line management, strategic planning, doing a lot of operations assessments. We do much work with physicians around alignment strategies, et cetera. And if you can move to the next slide, I think you know, my work in, in uh, conjunction with my colleagues is that we really view ourselves as an industry resource. Our home base is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we uh, have been uh, together in this company for about 20 years. We have a client base of over 700 hospitals, healthcare systems and practices that really span um, the country, including Alaska and Hawaii. And we have services that span uh, cardi cardiac, vascular, neuroscience, uh, orthopedics, and spine, really are our core service areas. 
And we pretty much do everything soup to nuts. We do recruitment, we do uh, for uh, key service line positions as well as uh, physicians to in those specialties. Um, we also do uh, accreditation for uh, programs in uh, chest pain center accreditation, uh, cath lab accreditation, uh, and then uh, overall accreditation for services. We also, and this is important, we also uh, engage with medical experts who are uh, practicing physicians. We actually had a, a webinar with them this week. Many of them are at the front line. One's a cardiac surgeon in the heart of New York City. One's an uh, ED physician in Chicago. And so I, I mentioned that because we bring um, uh, some resources and some information to the COVID crisis that we believe are cutting edge front line and um, are using our advisors in a way to help hospitals uh, deal with the COVID crisis as well as uh, ramp back up as we begin to get back to the new normal. Um, we also um, have uh, conferences and do webinars like the one Stephanie is sponsoring today. And, and we have a conference uh, coming up hopefully in October of this year. If you can move to the next slide, please. So today I wanted to start with uh, impact on operations. And you know, for me uh, in the COVID crisis, uh, operations really have been um, turned on its head. Um, and so many organizations that are in the thick of the COVID crisis have had to deal with huge challenges related to capacity, uh, nursing, protecting uh, uh, patients as well as staff. Um, I do think that there are uh, critical considerations as hospitals are approaching uh, the, the operations that it is important that you have a very multidisciplinary approach to the effort and it, it can't just be nursing, it can't just be physicians. You've got to have really on that task force, uh, leaders from all of the operational areas, the uh, director of the ICU, the director of the operating room, uh, physicians who um, can weigh in on uh, case selection and the kinds of patients that we should be doing. Certainly the uh, infection control folks that are guiding the kinds of practices that are happening in your units and how you're uh, operationally um, uh, gearing up uh, to either add negative pressure rooms, for instance, um, has been critical to how hospitals have had to tailor and to change operations to respond to the crisis. One of the things that I do believe has been essential uh, in this process is medical staff leadership. Uh, we have, as we talk with best practice programs, we have found that in organizations where physicians have stepped up and really um, uh, provided their insights to administrators and to um, the healthcare uh, team, uh, that these are the organizations that have had a smoother transition uh, and have are managing uh, the crisis on the front line. And this really takes a lot of time, a lot of um, energy from uh, leadership. And you know, often it's two, three times a day meetings, et cetera, to kind of regroup um, because you know, once you think you have a plan, you, you have to tweak that plan and redevelop that plan. And so it has been um, interesting to see how that uh, multidisciplinary approach and that task force approach has had to continue. Um, and so as we have some hospitals that are affecting or um, changing the timing for reopening of elective surgeries, for instance, you know, there's a lot of uh, guidance that they get from national organizations around uh, uh, CMS, for instance, the CDC, all of some of the professional societies are providing guidance uh, to their uh, members. And so, you know, defining levels of urgency has been quite important. And, you know, as, as Stephanie alluded to, you know, the elective cases have really gone by the wayside as we face the, emer the emergency crisis of COVID. And so in, in our area of consulting, and you think about cardiac, uh, orthopedics, and neurosurgery, or neurosciences, many of those procedures were elective. And so we've seen activities really come to a, a screeching halt uh, other than those uh, emergent cases that needed to go to the OR or to the cath lab. And so 
Um, the reopening um, is not universal, and we see that reopening really paced to really regional incidents of uh, COVID, and the, the uh, pace of reopening will be um, different across not just state to state, but sometimes it's county to county. I'm sorry. Um, I thought okay, I had that. To the best I'm sorry. Of us. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think important for organizations as they do relaunch is as they decide to take on elective capacity, they really need to work to um, define that case selection and the scheduling implications for the elective process. And so, you know, sometimes what we find that organizations really need to develop a capacity goal. And uh, we are seeing organizations set that goal at 50% of their pre-COVID activity. Uh, again, in, in areas like New York, where they still have a very significantly high COVID population in their hospitals, uh, that goal may be a little uh, challenging for them. But to really determine how many procedures or surgical days um, can be accomplished based on the staff at hand and the new normal. Uh, when we look at the OR times and the OR turnover times that uh, need to be in place uh, in our COVID environment, and even if it's a COVID negative patient or if you have COVID positive patients that you are taking to the OR, it really changes that room turnover time in terms of the number of air handle or air exchanges that need to happen and the cleaning uh, protocols that need to be in place. Um, likewise, there are things, uh, for instance, with anesthesia who may have, you know, moved room to room uh, with the anesthesiologist, with nurse anesthetist, maybe um, managing those cases. And those things uh, will not happen in, in this environment uh, and, you know, having uh, staff that have to don and doff um, uh, PPE uh, differently than they did pre-COVID uh, certainly will impact both procedural rooms as well as the ICUs. Uh, it will be important as, um, as we move forward that within facilities, we have appropriate protocols and policies in place to su support safe care. And uh, with that is the availability of accurate testing. So we're seeing many hospitals that are bringing patients back in electively have patients report to pre-admission testing uh, 24 to 48 hours prior to their uh, scheduled uh, procedure time or OR time so that they can be pre-tested and be ruled out as COVID positive uh, prior to uh, their procedures. And then having the patient really isolate um, pre-procedure so that they are not exposed to uh, other people in the, the general population prior to their procedures. For staff and patients, you know, we are trying to minimize their risk. And so the PPE availability is going to be essential. And so really for hospitals, as they predict what their caseload will be, they also need to test and be sure that they have the appropriate PPE available for those elective cases and any surge in COVID activity that they um, may um, experience. And so it is a day-to-day -day evaluation and a, almost predicting, okay, if we were at 50% this week, can we go to 60% elective cases next week? What will that do for the impact on staff? What will that do on the impact of um, bed availability? And it's not just what happens in the OR, what's going to happen in those post-care units. And so, you know, if your open heart patient has a typical seven-day length of stay and then they're in the ICU for two days, can we predict that and model that in a way that allows us to be able to understand what our bed need will be, what our staff need will be, and whether we have sufficient ancillary support? So as Corazon, we're actually working to develop some um, modeling tools that will help hospitals do that uh, and really work to understand what that looks like for specific specialties. I will tell you, I often, as I talk with physician leaders within specialties, I often challenge them to say, well, that, that works for your specialty area, but how are we going to take these plans for orthopedic ramp up, for cardiac surgery ramp up, 
and begin to dovetail those together because it's not all about just that specialty. We've got to be sure that overall we've got enough ORs, overall we've got enough ICU beds and how we're going to balance our COVID positive patient population with um, those that are not are not COVID, COVID positive. The other piece um, that we can't ignore, and you know, I always talk about the top of the funnel, you know, for hospitals in the acute care, they have to be sure that their office operations are ready to ramp up. And so, you know, many organizations, as they have uh, stopped elective procedures, they've had to furlough some of their office operations. And so we've got to bring those people back on board. We've got to be sure we've got revised intake policies in terms of how we are uh, uh, querying those patients post pre-procedure, how we intake them into the office, how we've changed our waiting room space, how we've changed the way they check in and check out in the office. And again, that whole uh, pre-testing or pre-admission process needs to be hardwired in a new way. And the offices have to really work hard to manage the backlog. They have, you know, in the orthopedic world, they have significant backlog of cases that need to be brought back in and, and um, be um, scheduled for procedures. We've found that the cardiac uh, uh, folks really have uh, tried to keep in close contact, particularly with patients that uh, may be needing procedures but have been elected or have been managed medically in the, in the near term. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. And I just want to jump in there for one second because I think you touched upon the office information and I saw something that was really creative uh, from a hospital this week that was quite frankly in today's environment pretty smart, but they actually did little videos of the new office arrangement within one of their clinics and showed how they had the seat spaced out what the actual check-in process was like and actually just did a video clip walking the patients through what it was going to look like for them when they came back to the office. I thought that was a pretty smart thing to do because it, you know sometimes if you tell me, I don't hear, but if you show me, now I get it. So it's just another way that people are being creative and okay, what can we do to make people comfortable? So I just wanted to jump in there that there was something interesting that I saw this week. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because as we talk to our medical advisors this week, they're actually, uh, we have a medical advisor who's a hand, hand and upper extremity uh, physician, and he actually has an uh, ambulatory surgery center. And as they were ramping up, they're actually asking families and telling them ahead of time that we'll come out and get your family member, but we'd ask you to stay in your car for the length of the procedure. And then we will, our nurses will be in touch with you via, you know, um, conference or uh, telephone, and uh, that the doctors are actually going out and meeting with families at their cars after the procedure. So it really has changed the touch and the way people are interacting. Uh, and, um, you know, some of it's not all bad. As we talk with physicians, they say, you know, I never thought this would work, but it actually has been a, an interesting process and a different way to deliver care. And you know, I think one of the things that uh, we feel as a consulting firm is that there will be things that stick after COVID. There will be things that we've been forced to try out. And one of them I will tell you is telehealth. You know, we've been a big proponent of telehealth for many years, and we've seen it be used successfully for our neuroscience uh, programs in their uh, stroke delivery uh, and identification of stroke and being able to give TPA you know, at rural hospitals, um, hub and spoke hospitals, and it has worked very well. There have been many, many obstacles to telehealth, um, both from a credentialing standpoint, physicians working across state lines. Much of it has been a payment issue in that, they had, you know, the insurers and CMS had very stringent and limited payment strategies. I, it was interesting because I did hear Seema Verma talk about it, and this uh, on your slide is a quote from her that was um, in an in a, a article on Becker's, it was the headline and it was quote, the genie's out of the bottle on this one. And she was hinting at the future of telehealth for CMS beneficiaries. And, and I do think it's one of those things that will stick. What we hear from our physician advisors is that many patients, because they've had to experience it as part of this COVID crisis, they think that it can be a way to help manage patients on a go-forward basis more efficiently. 
we've seen expansion from what had been um, things like dermatology, psychiatry, the um, uh, provision of telehealth for neurosciences. We're seeing that being expand to other specialties where you know uh, the specialists are providing uh, telehealth consults in the ED. We see um, telehealth specialties uh, or telehealth care being delivered uh, now by PT, OT, and speech. Uh, and so, you know, we're finding new ways to extend that care out into patients' homes and finding ways to uh, manage chronic uh, diseases uh, in a different kind of way. So with that expansion to other specialties and practitioners, we've, we've also seen changes in billing and coding that need to um, get hardwired uh, into uh, hospital and physician practices. Um, those codes initially came through as temporary codes, and it's our belief that as we move forward, those will um, in some ways be permanentized and, and uh, again, become part of the care delivery um, offerings that we have uh, for our patients and families. We do know that it does take increased staff time to uh, get the patients queued up, being sure that they have connectivity and can be uh, available for that physician consult. Um, so it's it has been a learning curve uh, for office staff, uh, for physicians, and for um, sometimes the elderly patient that need to engage their family uh, with them to um, get connected for that telehealth um, uh, consult. Some of it does happen on the telephone, but certainly that video conference availability has been helpful. And as I said, I, I think we need to be prepared to understand that as we pace out what our future is, that, that we understand that uh, telehealth may be a, a vehicle that allows us to uh, provide care in a new and different kind of way. Next slide, please. You know, um, as we look at the, the COVID crisis, uh, facilities and our infection control processes have been top of mind. And so as we look to loosen um, how we are going to uh, care for patients, you know, there have been, again, much guidance, uh, CMS, and there is a, um, a reference at the bottom of the slides that I think are very helpful, but, you know, the whole case selection in terms of what we're tier one, tier two, medium criteria, and tier three high criteria, and what the settings of care are that uh, as we initially clamp things down, and then as we um, uh, move to more elective procedures, how we will loosen that back, back up. I think one thing's clear is that in both the procedural and the surgical suites that we have had to add um, 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 new processes and, and ways of dealing with the COVID population. Uh, certainly, it's not something that, that looks like it's going to go away in the near term and that we still will need almost this parallel process of how we're dealing with COVID versus non-COVID uh, surgical cases. And so hospitals, um, I think, initially put in some changes facility-wise in terms of the negative pressure requirements in their ORs, in flipping um, some of those rooms from positive pressure to negative pressure, um, putting um, anti rooms uh, outside of some, some rooms where they could intubate patients, et cetera. So, you know, many, many things have been done in conjunction with their um, infection control folks, as well as their facility folks to be able to uh, provide safe facilities. Uh, and I think that that will um, continue as we move forward. Certainly, uh, mandatory PPE compliance is something that um, has facility implications, but also has implications um, on the supply chain standpoint. And so, um, you know, many organizations, they're purchasing and, and um, delivery people, people that, that are processing equipment, delivering equipment, it has created huge challenges for many organizations. And so when we think about those frontline caregivers like nurses and doctors, we also have to think about the environmental services people that are, that are terminally cleaning rooms and the policies and procedures we have in place to be able to you know, turn over those rooms become critically important and being sure that you know, not only do we do that so we have you know, clean rooms for the next case, but we're protecting our frontline 
uh, workers uh, as well. I mentioned before about um, ancillary providers and certainly as we are asking people to don and doff PPE, it changes the way they deliver care. And so, you know, for the ancillary services that may in the past have brought patients from the floor to the echo lab, for instance, they may need to flip that and be able to take that equipment to the floor to deliver care, don the PPE there and go into the patient it adds time to what they do. So some of the expectations around their productivity will need to change. Uh, and how we staff, we may need to staff up in order to provide the services that we had provided in the past. I spoke to anesthesia before. I am always concerned because in our experience, anesthesia has been one of those services that are stretched in a million directions and they're in the OR. We pull them out of the OR to the cath lab for uh, TEEs or for um, uh, electrophysiology procedures or uh, for device implants, et cetera. And so their availability to move in and out of the OR and to uh, be available in the procedural areas has been a challenge in the past. Now with this new COVID um, uh, requirements on top of that, I do worry that the anesthesia um, availability will be, I don't want to say a deal breaker, but we'll need to be part of the think as we go to 50%, 60% uh, and, and uh, back to 100% uh, capacity on the elective uh, procedures. Um, the other piece, and we've heard much about this through the through the COVID crisis, but procedures that require ventilators or IEBPs, we need to, you know, remain vigilant that we have enough equipment as we bring elective cases back in. So if that uh, uh, open heart patient needs to go on the ventilator for two days, do we have enough ventilators? Can we do five open hearts next week that each require? And on average two ventilator days. And so, you know, being sure that not only are we looking at staff and rooms, et cetera, but we're also looking at the uh, available um, support equipment that would be necessary for each procedure. Next slide, please. I think the other thing that um, has been kind of top of mind for us is that as we work in this um, COVID world and transition to elective procedures, it will stress our workforce. Um, this actually is a graphic from the Journal of Neurosurgery. I did find it interesting and I always try to find kind of the generic nuggets of information that are in some of these uh, publications. One of the things that uh, I am a firm believer and one of my mantras is that, you know, everyone should be working to the top of their license. And so, you know, as often as we look at the APP, those, those nurses and physician assistants that are part of our care teams, um, are we allowing them? Have we allowed them to work to the top of their license? And um, as we do that, you know, does that mean we need to redefine roles? And is this an opportunity because we are stretching people in lots of different ways, that we move from an area of task sharing uh, or what we want to be sure is that we are not just task sharing um, and that we're not shifting um, uh, the, um, the roles. So how we do that is we do need to update competencies. Uh, we need to be sure as we're asking people to take on um, new roles and new responsibilities that we have the companion education and kind of those check sheets that say, yeah, they, they know how to do it, they can do it independently. We also need to be sure that as we are changing policies and how we care for patients, that we hardwire and look to the evidence that's out in the literature to drive how that practice is changing. And that we revisit that on a regular basis. And that, you know, we used to update policies and procedures on an annual basis. We may need to be doing that more regularly as we work through um, the new norm, and it will and it will change, and it will probably change more regularly than that once a year. And that we need to know, and we need to be sure that this disaster uh, that we've lived through is going to be and is going to require an ongoing disaster preparedness. And so, as I look and hear things in the 
the news, for instance, you know, about uh, the, the children that are presenting with new symptoms. And it, it, you know, it was an adult issue before, and now we're dealing with, um, and, you know, hopefully not, but, you know, the significant number of cases in children uh, in um, New York is, is really shocking. And what are we going to have to do to prepare if that becomes uh, a, a new um, phenomenon as we work across the country? And so um, what we want to be sure is that we're looking at task sharing and not just shifting of ta tasks. Next slide, please. And I think, you know, this is really getting to the last of uh, my, my kind of slides and then we'll open it up to questions. But I do want to focus on the role of the physician in all of this. Uh, I do think they have stepped to the plate and have, um, uh, stepped up working with administrators to help drive decision making. Uh, I think the collaboration and communication with physicians is essential. And, you know, we have worked as a company to really uh, build and encourage hospitals to uh, work in dyad and triad partnerships with their physicians to uh, lead and guide program development. I think in this COVID world, we do need to acknowledge uh, their increased visibility and leadership, not just within their programs, but in the hospital in general as we work through this crisis. Um, like Stephanie said, I do think um, communication uh, strategies and communication effectiveness is essential to moving forward. I do find that if organizations can have a single source of truth for information and whether, whatever vehicle that is, whether that's um, safety huddles or a, uh, a daily um, news update from the CEO of the hospital, but there does need to be a single source of truth. I do find, and particularly with physicians, sometimes they feel like they're out of the loop. And uh, in the absence of information, sometimes they fill in the blanks. I think that can be quite dangerous for organizations. And so um, being sure that we spend a lot of time uh, looking at communication, um, mechanisms and assuring that we're touching nurses and doctors to be sure that we hear their concerns and that we're able to um, be sure everybody has the same information. I think importance uh, or the ability to engage physicians in protocol de development and be sure we have their buy-in uh, for reopening and relaunch. And that's not just with leaders, that physician leader needs to know it, but all of their colleagues in the orthopedic department or all of their colleagues in cardiology need to be sure that that plan is well communicated so there is not um, uh, any um, ambiguity. We hear from physicians that, and many of these are in the busy COVID centers, that they're working on a week on, week off schedule or a, 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 a team A, team B, team C, to be able to uh, decrease their exposure to the COVID patient population and to be able to get them some needed rest so that they're able to either prep for the surge of COVID or they're able to prep for the, you know, the relaunch and the, uh, the backlog of patients. Um, we do find and we're encouraging hospitals uh, to look at evening and weekend service uh, recovery to deal with backlog procedures and whether that's procedures or diagnostic testing. It's gonna take a bit to kind of climb out of all of the um, delayed cases or the deferment of elective cases. And the sooner hospitals can um, get them, again, sometimes diagnostic testing can be the top of the funnel. And so we've got to get that back open and get those patients tested so that they can move on to either a procedure or to um, uh, uh, surgery. Uh, the other piece that we think is important is really um, for many of these physicians, that elective case has um, decreased, has um, resulted in compensation losses. And whether they're employed physicians or whether they are private practice physicians, um, that compensation structure, like hospital finances, uh, can be affected. And we think hospitals that are working um, with their physicians, again, open, honest communication about those contracts, about how their payments or quarterly draws against um, uh, any productivity measures um, need to be uh, well communicated and um, 
and dealt with open and honestly. Not that the CEO has to have the answers, but certainly open communication around, you know, how that will work. Um, because you know they're they're working hard, they're making a contribution. They as well are worried about, um, you know, their financial situation and taking care of their own families. And lastly, you know, we think organizations have been on paths to recruiting um, for um, uh, additional medical staff. Uh, many of them will have urgent medical staff needs and we can't forget about that. And so we're finding some best practice programs that are really working to provide Zoom meetings to as ways to interview or doing virtual tours with physicians so that they can keep the process moving and that they can then have uh, physicians that are queued up once the travel restrictions are lifted, they can have them queued up to come in and more rapidly bring those patients or bring those physicians on board. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, post COVID in the future, you know, I, I hear new norm, I say that a lot. Um, I think that it will be evolving day to day um, and that there are many forces that will be um, in play as we look at practice and how it will change. I do think virtual healthcare will have a place in the future and uh, physician collaboration is, uh, I think, going to be essential now and as we move into the future. Um, I also think it will be important that as we move day to day, week to week, that we need to be able to chronicle uh, the lessons that are learned and that we need to celebrate those and also be sure that we are able to um, implement and hardware some of those lessons into new practice. Next slide, please. So the new norm will be um, uh, national, state, and locally driven. Many phasing strategies we hear about, and again, different uh, region to region. And you know, even within our state of Pennsylvania, different from the east uh, side of the state to the west side of the state. Um, and that remote work appears to be that it will continue and increase. Um, and that some of that may uh, affect uh, ancillary departments. People have found that finance is working from home and that that may not be all bad in the future. So, you know, we'll see if any of that will stick. Um, we do think there will be continued focus on the number of people in a meeting room or in one location and hospitals will need to work to manage that. And that, you know, that preparedness for future disruptions, I think will be ongoing. So at this point, I'll turn it over uh, to Stephanie to field questions and um, look forward to uh, the, any interaction with you. Thank you, Susan. It was great information. Really appreciate all of the advice that you've been able to share. And I do have a few questions. And Johnny, I think some of them uh, you may actually you know, be able to answer as well um, some of the information. The first one is, you know, our hospital's been focusing a lot on cross-training staff throughout our clinics where appropriate. And sometimes we struggle with making sure that as we're also cross-training individuals, that we build those individuals up to the top of their license. Are there any advices that, you know, advice that you could give to the hospital on what they can do to make sure they're cross-training the right people, but also they wanna make sure everyone's working at the top of the license? Um, the one thing I would offer, and I, I see this in many organizations that I go in, and that is uh, the state department, your professional nurse organization, or whatever um, job skill that you're looking at, classification, look at the state regulations and make sure that it's clearly understood what is within their scope of practice, um, and it varies state to state, and uh, that's the one place I would start is making sure that, that you're not just um, saying, oh, well, this person should be able to do this. Are they, is it allowed within the state for them to function at that level? And I think some of the regulations have loosened a little bit, but it is very critical that you follow within their scope of practice. That's the first place to start. Yeah, and I think I can add to that a little bit. Um, you know, we find that as you ask people to do that, often they are very willing to take on new roles and responsibilities. But it does uh, present a lot of stress, um, both in the teaching and the learning. Um, and sometimes it takes time for people to learn new skills and people learn at different paces. 
And so being sure that as we ask people to take on new roles, there's a clear path for understanding how they're educated and some clear endpoints so that we are sure that as they take on new tasks, that they are uh, competent and confident in that delivery. And so it really, um, it's, it's not, it's not as easy as it sounds if you do it well. And so it, it does need to be hardwired and, and it has to have a, a standardized approach so that as you're cross-training multiple individuals, they don't each get a different uh, curriculum, so to speak, and that there are standard requirements in terms of what's um, required for that new job role. Great answers. So the next question deals with um, the operating room schedule and actually prioritization of patients. And it is, we're currently in the process of building out our reopening plans for our clinic. We're struggling with understanding if it's gonna be best to alter days, alter weeks, alter shifts, and how best to accommodate this, as well as assigning the priority to patients. Any recommendations on the prioritization of elective cases that have gone on for too long without procedures? and or de developing out a schedule that can also allow us to clean in between cases and all the other priorities of COVID-19? Oh, that's a really loaded question. And I will tell you, I, it's, it's not an easy answer. As we talked with our medical advisors this week, uh, there is guidance nationally around how that elective uh, or how that opening up cases should happen. Um, one of our uh, medical advisors uh, had talked about the priorities for uh, cancer care, uh, cardiac care, uh, transplants, and organ donations as the, the uh, given the top priority in terms of um, moving forward. Uh, he was uh, at a hospital in Brooklyn in a very hard hit area of the city. Uh, and so, you know, again, dealing with significant challenges, um, but his, um, in his situation and in several other of our medical advisors, they had said that they had um, not or have not gone back to block scheduling, that based on the criteria and guidance of a, a group of physicians that were guiding case selection and, and uh, determining the cases that would be on the schedule, that um, they would then um, schedule cases um, based on those individual, either clinical, uh, specialty, or case priorities uh, to be given uh, case times, and that they really had not gone back to the traditional block schedules that have been in place. As far as the clinics, again, it really becomes one of those issues, or, and again, requires a coordination, because if you begin to, begin to see patients back in the office, you know, do you schedule that um, that uh, knee replacement two weeks out? Um, the other piece that is needs to be um, significantly considered is location of service. And so, can we do that knee in an ambulatory surgery center versus an inpatient OR or an outpatient OR? And so, you know, how we're able to not only care for that patient or get them OR time, we've got to understand where are they going post care and do we have enough beds? So it really is a very complex um, situation and will require physicians, nurse leaders of particular units and, and the office staff to work in close collaboration to make those decisions uh, as we ramp up. Great information. And then the Can final question. Sure, go ahead, Johnny. Oh, I was just going to say, in addition to what Susan said, and her points were spot on, perfect, as far as um, the answer. The only thing I would add is that I am very much into structure and process. And so it's critical that it is formalized, that you do bring the physicians together collectively, your department chair of surgery, department chair of anesthesia, and whether you have an OR committee, and that they come up with the criteria so that because what happens in reality is that it becomes peer pressure and it becomes um, sometimes a little bit ugly and that um, this physician has been practicing 40 years and he has um, priority over the others. It has to be very objective and uh, standardized as you reinforce Susan on the criteria that was developed by the committee. So I really go back to structure and process, make sure that you have a formal committee that's reviewing and designing and determining um, who, how you're going to move forward and what cases take priority 
and um, I agree 100% with what Susan said. Great, and then one last question before we wrap up is, you know, we're currently in the midst of working through the virtual world. Everything has really moved to telehealth for the last seven weeks. I work in a cardiology clinic, and I'm just wondering, what have you heard about the different amount of time and the different types of staff that it requires to support a virtual health cardiology visit versus an in-office visit? Well, on the cardiology side, it's it's a little um, different. Well, and I can't, uh, you know, as, as orthopedics as well. You know, there are um, many conditions that the physicians can talk with the patient and review their medication list and review their symptoms, but certainly their ability to listen to heart sounds, for instance, or to be able to listen at the base of their lungs. We right now do not have kind of adjunctive ancillary devices that are hooked up to that telemedicine um, consult or, or the telemedicine um, platform, but certainly, um, there are many things that they can do from a telemedicine standpoint. I do think it has challenged many offices to just get the patient set up. And so, you know, I don't want to underestimate the amount of time that their MAs or the people in the office are spending getting that patient queued up for that telemedicine visit. But, but certainly um, engaging um, caregivers and certainly you know, as we talk about people working at the top of their license, can the uh, the nurse practitioners or the the APPs or the PAs provide some uh, initial contact with patients, not necessarily for a new patient, but for an ongoing patient? Can they provide um, some interface with that patient and their family members, and then um, understand when, in fact, they need to engage the physician in that consult? So, it, you know, I think that there will be a lot of learning. Um, and um, again, with the telemedicine um, consults, uh, we're encouraging our clients to think about how we can uh, engage our uh, full care team at working at the top of their license to be able to uh, provide that care. I think that's great information. And as you mentioned, Susan, we're all learning through this time together. And the one thing to mention to everyone is the information's evolving. And I believe that as the healthcare industry moves through the current you know, resources for the pandemic and also the response and the ongoing need, we're gonna have a lot of best practices that come out of all this and a lot of innovation. And all of those best practices and innovations are going to be for the quality of care and to provide solutions that will stick around because not everything that's happening right now is bad. And there are a lot of good, it's been a great time to see innovation between healthcare workers, innovation between hospital workers, and there are solutions that are coming to the table now that never would have been created without the current pandemic. So even though we're living through a period of time that has a lot of hurt, a lot of harm, and a lot of things we need to, to do, we will figure some things out that allow us to move forward as an industry a little bit faster and allow us to innovate at a level that we never have been before. And with that, Susan, Johnny, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great information on both specialty practices as well as nursing. And let's just wrap up with, you know, recognizing our nurses and frontline staff, physicians, EMTs, emergency directors, clinic staff, radiology staff, laboratory staff, everyone that's doing so much right now to provide services to the community, COVID-19 patients and non-COVID-19 patients. We salute you and to the nurses, you're our nurturing mentors, our unwavering professionals. You are reliable resources, selfless individuals, empathetic caregivers, and most importantly, superheroes in scrubs. So thank you again, Susan and Johnny, for you know, joining us today. And thank you, everyone else. You can look for this on YouTube. You can also find it in the Alpheus portal. And for the rest of you, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, as well as LinkedIn. And you can find all the information there for our current clients. Reach out. We'd love to find any additional information that you have and answer any questions that you have about today's topics. And for the rest of the audience, if you want to contact Susan Heck, her information was early on in the presentation. And if you're interested in fielding questions for Johnny Taylor, you can find her information early on in the presentation as well. And there you have it to wrap up in the two email addresses. You can find Susan Heck at Corazon at a-S-H-E-C-K at corazoninc.com 
And you can find Johnny Tiller at Altius at jtiller at altiushcg.com. Thank you both for joining and thank you everyone for listening. We'll join you next week on the, this version of Altius Roundtable. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. This virtual roundtable discussion was brought to you by Altius Healthcare Consulting Group. For more information about anything you heard on today's roundtable or to learn about services provided to hospitals and healthcare delivery systems by Altius Healthcare Consulting Group, visit our webpage at www.altiushcg.com. To be able to get updates on future roundtable discussions, please send an email to info, that's I-N-F-O, at A-L-T, IUSHCG.com and let us know that you'd like to be added to our mailing list. Those on our mailing list will find, be the first to find out about future roundtable discussions. Thank you so much. Have a great day.